Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, and welcome to Scream Something, Volume 14. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co-host, Producer Neil. Hey everybody, in Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 4 that were released over the last two Thursdays. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the season finale. That you are the most unforgiving excuse for a sister! Wait a minute! Wait! Nothing I do will ever be enough, will it? Emory, I'm a professional guidance counselor! I know you're trying to judge your medical And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's episodes are Odnu and Nomad Aser. Uh, the release dates were December 2nd and 9th of 2021. The in-episode dates were May 13th through 14th. The directors were Christina Soda and Christopher Berkeley. The writers were Jake Baumgart and Kevin Grivieu. I sadly... I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but if he would like to come on the show and correct us, we would welcome him wholeheartedly. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 9 starts with a cryptic and ominous explanation of how the Lords of Chaos and Order came to be, and after the credits, we cut to Manhattan, where Zatanna is leading her three teen protégés, Tracy, Mary, and Holid, in a magical training exercise. However, their post-training debrief is interrupted by a new Lord of Chaos arriving on Earth and sending out a pulse of chaos energy that's felt by spellcasters and other magical individuals all around the world, including Clarion, who rushes out of the uh, meeting of the Light to go investigate. We then cut to a flashback 12,000 years ago when Vandal Savage's first attempt at a metahuman utopia was destroyed by Clarion. And in the present, that amorphous Lord of Chaos we saw earlier enters a jewelry store, anthropomorphizes a diamond into her anchor on the mortal plane, takes on the appearance of a young girl, and adopts the name Child. A lot happens in a minute and a half. Oh my. And over in Hollywood, Beast Boy's having a crisis that no adult is adequately intervening in. And elsewhere, Z and the Teen Magicians, the name of my next band, meet with Madame Xanadu, who's able to transport them to the last known location of whatever caused that magical energy pulse, the jewelry store that Child has just left. Before they can fully wrap their heads around the devastation Child has left in her wake, Clarion arrives. A giant magical fight ensues, but is interrupted by Child summoning Clarion to Roanoke Island. And we wrap up the episode by revealing that the flashbacks of the first meeting and tentative peace agreement between Vandal Savage and Clarion were actually being narrated by a mysterious stranger reminding Vandal of his history. Episode 10 then opens with a continuation of those Vandal Savage flashbacks with the growth and early prosperity of Atlantis and Vandal Savage's immortal grandson, Arian. After the credits, we cut back to Manhattan, where Z and the teen magicians are recovering from their fight, only to be approached by that phantom stranger we saw talking to Vandal Savage at the end of last episode. Over in Roanoke, Child explains that she's here to replace Clarion as the Lord of Chaos on Earth after his many failures over the past 12,000 years. And in Hollywood, the Beast Boy crisis continues. (laughs) Help this child. (laughs) And out in space, because we're cutting everywhere today, a baby bioship full of sad Martians continues its journey toward Earth as Emery tries to figure out how to help a grieving McGann. Then in flashbacks, we find out that King Arian of Atlantis was gifted a magical crown by the Lords of Order and that the gift infused him and his bloodline with magic, leading to the creation of spellcasters on Earth as Atlantis continues to grow and expand. And in the present, the Phantom Stranger sends Zatanna to Roanoke to witness Child and Clarion's fight and takes the other magic kids to London to recruit Jason Blood for the chaos that is soon to ensue. And back out in space, Emery baits McGann into a catharsis and we all have a good cry about it. 
And back on Earth, the Phantom Stranger transports our three magical kids and the newly transformed Etrigan to Roanoke to witness the ever-escalating fight between Clarion and Child. In flashbacks, we see Vandal Savage make an agreement with Clarion to sink the capital city of Atlantis, soon followed by Clarion sinking the entire Atlantean continent instead, killing nearly every human citizen of Atlantis, but also activating the metagenes of some of the magicians, resulting in the new aquatic Atlantean citizens. Back in the present, Etrigan tries and fails to kill Child. Child decimates the local landscape in a failed attempt to kill Clarion, and Zatanna nearly drowns. Again, a lot happens in a minute and a half. Clarion escapes the combat and is followed by Child, while Zatanna tells the other magicians that they're going to need more help. We end the episode with the reveal that the flashbacks we've been seeing have actually been Vandal Savage monologuing to Dr. Fate in an attempt to convince him that Child must be stopped before she can replace Clarion if they're going to prevent the destruction of Earth. And with that, holy moly. Let's feel some aster. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So, I'm going to start off feeling the aster with my one negative so that I can get it out of the way first and then I can just talk about all the things I like in these episodes. So I don't like the gore. That was a big part of especially uh, episode nine, less so in episode 10, but it was a whole thing in episode nine. And I I didn't like the extreme gore last season and I don't like it this season. It's just not my vibe. And I don't think it's fully necessary to, tell this story i know i was talking to some people about like i the blood splatter across the wall when the guard gets killed and child saying like i wonder what people look like on the inside like that's an enough for me to get the vibe and get the idea that like oh you're extremely dangerous and possible and like more weird and messed up than clarion got it I don't need the the later gore heavy shots of what goes down. I don't need that to get what's going on. Uh yeah. That's just my take. I know it doesn't bother some people. It's just it bothers me a little bit and I don't and I don't feel like I need it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm one of those people that it doesn't necessarily bother, but at the same time, it's like, oh, okay, I got to keep that in my mind. If I tell someone who I think should watch this show, that that's a thing that's going to yeah. come and get them. Because I, I agree the way that it, that that scene is set up, that it's pretty easy to maybe cut that portion. I think some of the stuff with Vandal could have been done differently, but like that has in my mind a little bit more of a place to illustrate like Clarion and his methods of like finding out, okay, yeah, this after 300 days, this guy really is without a doubt immortal. Nothing I can do can change that. Um, But yeah, the child one was, that was a lot. And I get that it's almost, it's, I will say the scene where they actually do, find the body shall we say adds the element of the idea of like child is trying to figure out this world to figure out how she can ruin it in some ways is kind of the implication of she is trying to understand things and i get that some people might argue of like that part of what is being set up about that character that she is learning and figuring things out in the worst way possible would get lost we haven't seen more of that yet and what that means and what it means that she's figuring things out so i don't know how necessary and relevant it'll be but i don't know i feel like the only thing that scene added was that concept of like oh this was done by someone who's trying to figure out how people work and i'm like that's an interesting take i don't know if there's maybe a less gross way for us to to do this so that i don't have to sit there looking at that image for so long but yeah yeah but again i mean yeah that cut to it and the cutaway i mean even the dialogue could still function without that image per se yeah that's part of it's almost like it's part of me kind of feels like you could do that scene in a way that would almost be creepier if it wasn't shown to the audience Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like if it was left like you, the audience, 
don't get to see what she has done. You just see everyone's reactions. I almost feel like that might have worked. Not, I don't want to say worked better, but would have made me less like, uh, I don't want to, I don't love this. Uh, kind of that feeling of just the leaving it up to people's imaginations might have been just a little bit stronger in how in getting the creepy vibe across without making me just be like, I'll just stare a couple inches past my TV for the next 30 seconds and just listen to people talk. And I also feel bad because you have the introduction of D.B. Woodside and a second character named Marvin Fargo, who was in like one issue of um, the Joker comics from the 1975. And now he's gone <laughs> because of because, of course, all that happened. And it's true. Neil, are you telling me that every character who says a single line on this show is actually a reference to another character from a very deep comics lore history? This is entirely new information. It was two guards who got fired because the Joker escaped, but eventually they foiled his plans. And one of them was Marvin. So, Well, there you go. I, so with that out of the way, with my one negative of the thing I didn't really like these in this episode, let's get into all the stuff I do like, because there's a lot that's cool in these episodes, uh, starting with that I... Just getting to have a whole scene at the beginning of this that's just, here's a bunch of different types of magic, and we're going to animate all of them differently, and we're going to write all of them differently, and we're going to use them all in combat differently, and we're going to show you that there's a bunch of distinct forms of magic in the DC universe, and just make you go, this is the coolest thing, because it is. Yeah. It, that My note is like, okay, so you're tapping into ley lines, you're using urban magic, um... You're tapping into like the power of Shazam, but not really. But it does make sense because those are always wizards that give that out. Then you have the way that Zatanna does it. I mean, then also like to kick it all off, you're like, oh yeah. So on page one of the the like hundreds page story bible, sixteen billion years ago, you're like, okay, I guess I guess that's where we're starting this episode. Good. Yep. The, the literal like formation of this universe. Okay. It's wild. The history is deep. So I made a I made a note here because I felt you would probably have this answer. Uh let me guess. The guy that uh bumps into Zatanna in this episode, he's somebody, isn't he? That would be Henry Fife. Um and he actually so like rather than go because you know it can be saved for like other episodes. So we're only deep diving on the fact that he's already been in this exact same scenario in Young Justice, because he was the one that was wearing the good goggles that ran into Artemis. It's the same character. Thumbs up. Done. Yep. <laughs> we'll get into all that at a later date. Um, he's the guy who bumps into superheroes sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw out that the situation currently happening Marco in Markovia that we get a few more hints at in this episode, because we've just been sprinkling in hints about what's happening in Markovia this whole season, continues to be very troubling, to say the least. We, ha we have our first introduction to my best friend and yours, Dr. Jace, who is apparently still working with Ultra Humanite and just deciding to continue to use the tar to make more metas, which I feel like, I don't know, sometimes I feel like, guys, AKA team, AKA league, AKA outsiders. Like, you know what these people have and what they did with it previously. What is happening? It's, I think it ties into the problem of the, the whole thing of the league's not allowed to create an international incident. So it's the problem where the league is like, this is clearly a bad thing where bad people are doing weird science on a bunch of teenagers and we're not legally allowed to step in and we can't report it to anything because if we report it they'll go hey league how you know that stuff mm. and it spirals out of control well there you go <laughs> i'm assuming is the reason why no one has stepped in and gone hey markovia maybe maybe don't maybe stop please we'll see We've just kind of been having this very, just the low key background plot line of the political situation in Markovia. And we'll see if eventually it boils over into being a foreground problem. But right now, it's just going to be in the background, making us all stressed. Mm -hmm. I have apparently made a note here. I just want to shout out to 
The various magical animals this episode are very cute across the board. Tracy 13 now has a tiny lizard named Leroy, and I think he's adorable. And I have no idea what he's from, what he does, why he's here. But I feel like he deserves a little pat on the head and to be told that he's a good boy. So comics history wise, that that has always been her familiar. Like that's the association. And some of the stuff, the super funny thing is when you look this stuff up, um, like one of the go-to things, which is, I mean, it's fine, is like marital status. Leroy is single in case anyone was interested. <laughs> like, thanks. Now I know. Because it's just the, like the automatic, uh, like Wikipedia categories that uh-huh. show up under a character. Yep. It's, yeah, it's just the default ones. So also she can historically turn him into a dragon that, it, the, of course, has flight. She could ride, has a dragon breath, which is actually nodded to because when they get on the carousel figures, she gets on a green dragon when they're flying through. That Leroy tells her to get on, apparently, because yes. she can understand him, which I thought was Telepathically. Nice yeah. Yes. But which just across the board, Leroy, good, cute, fun, uh, fun to be around. I... The, for whatever reason, watching these episodes, my brain kept being like, Tickle, this, you know, vaguely amoral, kind of evil, magical cat. My brain just kept going, that's a very cute cat. Someone give that cat scritches. Because uh, that's apparently where my brain's at. And I just need to share that this evil cat, I feel like, <laughs> deserves love. No, because um, on, the re- on the rewatch, I watched Tickle stomp Leroy out that I had not not watched the first time. I did catch that both times, and I think it's – I don't love that, but do think it's funny that that was included in, like, we need to subdue all of these characters, and instead of sending another Clarion after Leroy, <laughs> Cat just comes in and is just like, step. <laughs> it's a very Cat thing to do. I'm a Cat person. I, I get it. <laughs> um, and I have further thoughts on Clarion and Teagle, but I will save those for either – later or if it comes up in another episode or we'll do it in deep dives because i have some various thoughts what else do we got here so other than various magical animals i it was also really fun to see mary bromfield show up uh since craig said a long time ago i think in an ask greg thing uh that the reason she and troya weren't on the team in season two was because both of them had both joined and left the team (laughs) during the five-year time skip. Uh, So it's nice to just finally get to like see her and hear some of like the hints of what actually happened with all that since it's been just one of those things in the larger Young Justice lore. If you, like me, you know, found out random bits and pieces of what was revealed through Twitter and Ask Greg over the years. You're like, hey, she's here now. That's fun. Yeah. It's hard not to think about the Shazam family with the introduction of Billy and Shazam at some point. Then you're like, well, as the story goes, and then you had like like you said, then it's also alluded to. And anything that tells me more about the five year gap, I'm in. <laughs> right? We're we're gonna piece together a timeline. Also, shout out to Erica Ishii, who it voices both Mary Bromfield and uh, Child in these episodes, who I'm so used to hearing in tabletop RPG shows that I didn't recognize her voice until I saw them make the announcement on Twitter about it. Once I saw the tweet, I was like, how did I not notice this? And rewatching the episodes, I'm like, yeah. of course, now I immediately hear it. But watching it the first time, it did not click. I'm... I'm so used to hearing them play the littlest, angriest vampire that it just (laughs) did not click for a good full watch through the first time. Also, there is there is one bus in all of Young Justice and it is constantly in danger. So and I, I assume this is known, but I just used this episode to like figure it back out, probably. So it's a metropolis school district is what's written on the side. Yes. It, and the previous gonna, times, it's been on the bridge to yeah. Metropolis. And then I couldn't figure out, like, how far is Manhattan from Metropolis? I have no idea how far Metropolis is from Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would, my, my in-universe headcanon guess at an explanation is that, for whatever reason, these kids, because it's all the same kids on the bus, I think they're older, because I didn't do a full <laughs> comparison of the shots, but it is the same kid designs <laughs> on this bus. Either this bus is some weird uh, temporal point in time, 
that does weird things and will never understand it. Or the Metropolis school bus district was on a field trip to Manhattan for reasons that will never be fully explained. With their bus driver, Mr. Frizzle. (laughs) Either way. There's one bus in Young Justice. It is constantly in peril. It being in space, uh, one episode later, gives me even more questions, which may or may not be answered. (laughs) But yeah, no, Uh, it's a fun throwback. And I love Zatanna just shrugging and saying, eh, buses happen. Like, I, I did not realize how much I had missed, like, Zatanna being, pardon the pun, ridiculously nonchalant. Uh, about everything all the time but i apparently really missed zatanna and the brand of humor they attached to her and it's very fun to have her back doing magic again it's very it's very good if nothing else i love these episodes for just zatanna being zatanna (laughs) yeah it's good Uh, and speaking of fun season one throwbacks it was cool to see madam xanadu again and get more uh about her and that whole thing yeah, which, I mean, historically, I mean, Young Justice has certainly done their own takes on the characters. That's what they're going to do. Historically, though, Madame Xanadu is more of what we see here because she becomes immortal because she makes a literal deal with death to say, no, thank you, sir. I, 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 do, not, I do not abide by your rules anymore. So, yeah, I thought it was a lot of fun. Yes. And I, it's just fun. It's all because uh, when she first showed up way back in season one, I remember lots of people all over the place were like, oh, my gosh, she's this character from these things with the DC comics. And uh, she's just in one episode and she doesn't get to do any real magic in that one. So getting to see her come back and be like, yeah, now she's that thing now. I'm like, that's just very fun and very cool. Uh, and on this train of everything, uh Clarion showing up in the jewelry store and both him and Zatanna immediately shouting, what did you do at each other? Like they're just long suffering, frustrated enemies is wonderful. I love the implied. I love all of the implied magical history for Zatanna in these episodes. Oh, yeah. Uh, And it's so much fun. It's this. It's the fact that she just knows Madame Xanadu and knows Uh how to get there. It's the later reveals that she just knows Jason Blood and Etrigan and is like not surprised when he shows up beyond like what are you doing here like she knows him by name I'm like I love it I what is it I had a note somewhere here that's just where that where where do I petition DC for like the magical adventures of Zatanna tie-in comic because I would read it I would read Zatanna's 10 years of magical study and learning of the rest of the magical DC universe uh, and I'm sure the next couple of episodes are just going to give us more of that stuff, and it's going to be fun. But like, I want I want to know how she met everybody. I want to see little little baby Zatanna meeting everybody and <laughs> networking, networking among the magical the magicians of the DC universe. Yes, I mean because she also recognized Stranger. Like it, like in going back to that nonchalant thing, like when she got tossed into where Clarion and Child are fighting, she's like, "Oh, Stranger." <laughs> not that it's, mad but a little frustrated just she, like the because because i feel like there's a level of like if zatanna really didn't want to be there she could have just teleported away she's just like fine i'll run with it this is annoying and i and i don't want to be here but i'm sure there's a point i also speaking of all of the implied history i love how quickly they establish the idea that clarion just knows who child is and knows that she's a problem. Like when she sends out the call for him to come to Roanoke and he's just like, not her. I can't believe they sent this one kind of of all the ones to send is what he says. And it's just this Mm -hmm. idea of one, all those chaos Lords just floating out in space, apparently all have distinct personalities and that would be wild. The fact that like he would recognize and understand her. And it's also a nice storytelling shortcut to kind of establish like if clarion of all people sees child as a problem (laughs) that's the quickest way to communicate to us the audience that like oh 
oh, she's a problem. <laughs> well, yeah, and that, and that's even his reaction is before you have the reveal that she has the full backing of the other Lords of Chaos. Like, yeah. That's why she's so powerful when they start fighting. I'm like, yeah. oh, well, good. Yeah. We'll see how this plays out. It's going to be an interesting couple of episodes. But in case people don't remember, the place that Child summons Clarion to is the same crossroads from the World Without Grown Ups episode in season one. Because, you know, some places in the DC universe just have more magic than others. Yeah. I would say those connecting ley lines, which I, it's interesting to also see them having yeah. been used throughout the episode more like in a ball. Yeah. Literally in more of a physical fashion. Yeah. Like they've been referenced before, but like to see them so right there is interesting. To be a source of magic, not just a general magical force in the universe, which also this scene brings us to the thing many people have been commenting on the earth 17 fiasco. It's an amazing line that made me laugh very hard because it's just, it makes you go, excuse me, what? And I have a feeling that we are never going to get more details about this. And that's honestly amazing just on its own that you can throw that line in as just an offhand. Here's something Clarion did off screen sometime. Yeah, and it's difficult because what what version of Earth six or seventeen would you look at? Like pre crisis, post crisis, New Fifty Two, back in the seventies and eighties. Ultimately, the general vibe and theme is nuclear apocalypse. So, <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> so we're not clear. Good. Uh, yeah, um, if you look at the int- like, there's one video game where you have like atomic versions of characters, like Atomic Wonder Woman, Atomic Joker, and they're theoretically from that earth so yeah it's like full full nuclear apocalypse mode so i assume clarion's the cause i mean i don't know but yeah we'll never know or it's its own separate thing from all of the other earth 17s because it might be because it's young justice man yes uh (laughs) but now for a thing that i thought way too hard about uh there is a moment in these episodes that's beast boy as Beast Boy continues to have a crisis, as we vaguely referenced in that in our synopsis for today, Beast Boy is clearly having an ongoing crisis that, as I said, no adult is adequately stepping in to assist with. And we will see how that plays out and what it means. I know I have my own personal worries about where this may be going, but I'm keeping all fingers and toes crossed that we send in Black Canary or anyone else with any mental health training to just check in on this boy. I'm not I don't know what I I don't know what specifically to say he should do. I just think some adult should be more adequately checking in on him, which is the larger context for in one of these scenes, um Garfield is staring at an old photo of himself Miss Martian and Superboy and me being me I started thinking way too hard and staring at the background of that photo to try and figure out when and where that photo was taken (laughs) and the concept I have come up with my theory for now until we get more information is that it might be from the trip to uh, Marie Logan's Animal Sanctuary that McGann and Connor take in the tie-in comics that we see in uh, flashbacks okay. when they're they're sent to like do a mission in Bialia and for a little bit they just hang out at Marie Logan's Animal Sanctuary because yeah. two birds one stone we might as well check in on your newly adopted brother while we go to help prevent some sort of assassination attempt I think was what they were trying to fix yes. So, which also is part of the flashbacks that lead to um, Marie Logan's death that we see in the in those last couple issues of the tie-in comics. Technically, if we're going to be very um actually about it, McGann's outfit isn't right in those photos to be the one that she was wearing during that visit. But that could just be an animation budget thing, because I do not begrudge a show with this many characters going... We do not have the the time and resources to adapt a whole other outfit to animation for two still shots that we will never see again. Uh, And I fully understand. I just want to throw it out there in case anyone tries to um actually me. Um, 
And like, I briefly considered that it might be the Kent farm, but the house design doesn't line up. Uh, and it could also, of course, be Marie Logan's uh, animal sanctuary on a different day. It could totally not be from this trip. But if Gar is looking at photos of the people he misses taken within a day or two of when his mother died, uh, then I'm even more worried about him. And I would like I would like an adult to check on this child. Yeah, that's my <laughs> that's my takeaway from these episodes is that the outsiders need additional adult supervision and need it immediately. Um, yeah, and it, it gets into like a little bit of a larger concept that I wonder about. But then you go back into the production budget and, and adding more people in and doing things like that. But the lack of league presence sometimes, I'm just like, where are you? Help, help. Um, but I also think of just like the burden that that puts on um, Blue Devil. I mean, how do you like? Unless you're equipped, you're not equipped um, to yeah. to broach those subjects and how you even begin to have those conversations. So, and I totally understand that. My my thought process there and my response to that is like, I feel like I've seen at least like somebody kind of comparing it to like Beast Boy, like living in a dorm, like like uh, Blue Devil is like an RA in a dorm, mm. and RAs go through like mental health crisis intervention training to like if you are the person in charge of teens or young adults like you go through some level of training of even if you are not the person who fixes a situation you're supposed to have some level of training of like who you call or what resources you bring in if you recognize warning signs and so yeah I'm just I I am just projecting my worry about this character onto all of the adults in the room and I get that some people are like well they don't have the full context that we as viewers have and everything but even the context that they have been implied oh, to yeah. have from the scenes of Beast Boy interacting with Blue Devil or the various things that he's not doing I'm like these are big warning signs and I would like someone to help and I'm just going to keep all of my fingers crossed that somebody does step in and help because yeah. I can just hope for the best right now. Uh, and we'll see. And we'll talk about it more as this arc plays out. I'm sure. <laughs> as we have been talking about it with many people for a while. <laughs> then we get to here's my one of my favorite little mini plot lines of this episode is everything happening with baby bioship in space. Because we all know I love Miss Martian and I'm trash. And so I love this entire little mini background storyline. And I'm going to hit some things very quickly. I love somebody finally acknowledging that McGann needs to get back to Earth because she needs to, like, grieve with her family that has actually actively known and interacted with her for the past 10 years because she has been away from Mars for so long that her blood relation family doesn't fully get what she's going through. And I like that acknowledgement that she needs her support system on Earth back. Uh, there is a quick moment in these uh, things set in space where Emery thinks, says, uh, OMC instead of OMG. If you look at the subtitles, that's mm -hmm. what they say. Uh, and this just continues to add to my ever-growing love of Martian linguistics and makes me go, so what's the name of the Martian equivalent of God leading I to this hilarious cultural abbreviation? Because yeah. I don't think it's been said. I don't think it was said in any of the like Martian wedding ceremony stuff that we were dealing with in those first four episodes, because I thought about that. I was like, did we ever get any? Nope, I don't think so. Uh, and it just makes me have questions. I like when the show throws in little things like that that make me go, I have, I would like the cultural guidebook to Martian society, please and thank you. <laughs> also, uh, Emery and McGann's argument, quote unquote, uh, for catharsis is perfection. I love it. I laughed very hard and then was emotionally touched by McGann breaking down and them having that nice moment. The I called it out on Twitter, the exchange of her saying, I'm a professional guidance counselor. I know you're just trying to generate a catharsis and <laughs> Emery screaming back. Well, is it working? And her saying a little bit like is perfectly delivered and hilariously written. And 
I love everything about it. Um, it's You're great. a terrible guidance counselor. <laughs> a pretty good sister. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> It's great. It's that moment of like when I was first watching it, when Emery just starts initially being like really like annoyed about everything out of nowhere. I was like, what are you doing? And then I like caught on in the middle of it. It was like, oh, you're just you're just playing this up as much as possible to see if this helps. <laughs> OK. Uh, and I like that McGann catches on that they don't let it just be like her actually getting a catharsis from yelling about it. It's like, no, I know what you're doing. <laughs> uh, it's good. I love it. I loved the way that was written. I loved the performance on both sides from everyone. It's a great little moment in these big magical episodes amid all of the other amazing stuff of like giant magical battles and lore drops and everything. It's just, here's just a couple of lines that will... <laughs> be amazing uh and finally for me last thing in my notes is that there's just a lot going on in that vandal savage and credits monologue but i'm sure we will get into that uh oh in a gosh bit. Yeah, op- operation lifeboat would you probably save that for yeah crashing yeah yeah i just wanted okay. to acknowledge that like that's a lot now what do you what do you have that we haven't covered yet um, leftover pieces. Uh, the introduction of Arion is really interesting. The Lord of Atlantis. That's always been, um, as far as I can tell, the way that he's referred to. And I'm just going to wait and I'm going to ask Rich and see what kind of, um, Wikipedia article he sends via text. Um, but yeah, it, it was just interesting to see, like, going that direction with Atlantis, with Arion, with the immortal, with the homo magi, with the homo meta. And then Mermanis, and it was just, yeah, it was, it was a lot. It was a whole, whole lot to take in. Other things. So I'm going to just say this, and then you can go, you, dear listener, can go watch. Um, there are some deep, not deep cut, but there's some really interesting gargoyle references inside Jason Blood's area. Yes. And if you know, you know. And if you missed it, I don't want to be the one to tell you. I want you to be the one to experience that for yourself. So I will leave that. I will plant that seed. Other things that Rich has alluded to over on the old Discord. Over on that old Patreon Discord. Indeed. Well, I like that his number one question was, did we get to see Gar react to the wave of chaos magic? I need to know, is this boy magical? <laughs> Because as Rich, as people who have remembered from season three, Rich is very invested in the entire concept of Beast Boy and the Monkey God and what all of that means and how it's all connected. And to answer Rich's question, no, No. we did not. We did not see Gar react to the wave of chaos magic in any way. Doesn't mean he's not magical, but it just means we're not being shown it. Yeah, we did see Blue Devil react and then that that is a version of Blue Devil is more magical um, than some other ones. The bus, his solution to the bus, reality time breaking down because of chaos? It's like, who knows? I I mean, who's to say? But chaos didn't cause it to be in Manhattan. (laughs) Did it? Who knows? Uh, Yeah. Again, like, if you're going to throw a bus into space with this show, I feel like that's going to get explained by the end of this arc i don't know how but i just feel like it will be if it's not fine it's just a weird thing but it feels like a thing that has an explanation that we just haven't worked out yet yeah and then the one of the things that i had also thought of and this isn't really crashing the mode but just the idea of who else could be introduced Theoretically, for both sides. I don't know that necessarily Child and Flaw will introduce more magical people. I don't really think they need them. But the idea of like what other magical people within the DC universe could pop up. Because, I mean, at this point, it's, I mean, you just threw in Phantom Stranger, you threw in Etrigan, all these people. So I want to see more magic. We'll see how, we'll see what happens. We got, we got three more, three more episodes of this arc. We'll see what happens. Yes. So. Let's let's crash some mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines and theories running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. So for this Crashing the Mode, it will be based on episodes 1 through 10. 
and the trailer, in case there's anything else we've missed in that trailer to dissect for all this. So my things, I have a couple quick things thinking way too hard about magic. I kind of like, I 99% think, I won't say I 100% think, just just in case, little margin of error here. I really think that Zatanna's little look of realization uh, near the beginning where she's like, in fact, in fact, you're my best students. And she kind of like stares off into space for a second. I think that is very much about her having some sort of project in mind for these kids of something that she needs some powerful, skilled magicians to help her with. And I feel like it's probably something to do with Dr. Fate. Because it feels like that's been an ongoing back of her mind project for Zatanna for 10 years. But, you know, we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> that's my take on that line, at least. Yeah, and my guess is is Holland, um, because they become Dr. Fate in some uh, some iterations in the comics. You already have his reaction to when Xanadu mentions Kent Nelson in the whole like doctor thing, like real world doctor pieces of like when I was, so I, I mean, that's, that's my guess. Certainly. I mean, it could go other ways. Um, the other one was that Vandal mentions basically your like ailing host body or something. Aging. Your aging. There it was. Aging. Yes. Aging host body. And I hear that. I've heard several people bring this up, which has been an ongoing topic among a lot of people. But the thing I, that I keep thinking is how way back in season one, we had the establishment of, Everybody, league, team, everyone involved being like, Dr. Fate's not allowed to take a kid kind of thing of that being one of the kind of not rules that's set up, but there is a general understanding and vibe to the idea that like, ever because several teenagers put on that helmet back in season one and everybody fights tooth and nail against Dr. Fate of like, you're not allowed to have them. That is a child. <laughs> Give them back kind of thing. Yeah, they were putting that thing on like it was going out of style. <laughs> I, they put, they only put it on in dire circumstances. It just so <laughs> happened that those kids dealt with a lot of dire circumstances. Almost half the team. Almost half the original team put that thing on. <laughs> it's, it's Kid Flash, Aqualad, and Zatanna. That's, we look, I mean, eight. That's, okay, that's three, three, out, three out of out seven. Eight. Yeah, it's three out of seven, three out of eight. You're okay. Right. Okay. I was like, it's not that many. It's it's a decent, it's a decent We're getting uh, close. section of that team. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's my one word. But if Holland has gone to first year medical school, maybe he's an adult and I just keep calling all of them magic teens because I'm used to calling everybody who isn't like the OG team uh kids and teenagers at this point. But who knows? He might be a young adult, but I'd still be very worried about him. There's just some yeah. general there's just some general problems around the whole Dr. Fate situation because he's not a lord of good. He is a lord of order. So, you know, amoral problems. But speaking of all that, I I personally think there's been a lot of talk about what has happened with that crown of order that Arian had, the Atlantis crown that was gifted to them by the Lords of Order and many theories being thrown around. I feel like it is eventually going to be turned into the Helmet of Fate like at some point in the several thousand intervening years. But we'll see. That might not make any sense. You know, conservation of mass and all that. But yeah. you, you show me a piece of Lord of Order headgear and then try to tell me that it's different from the other piece of Lord of Order headgear that we've seen. I don't know. I feel like there's a connection. It might be turned into something else. It might just still be at the bottom of the ocean. Who knows? I'm sure we'll find out. The last one's a little hard just because it's like you couldn't get anybody to get down there and get it. I mean, you got to know where it is. Like, You're telling me that in several thousand years, no magician like intervened and was like, I'm just going to go get that uh, real quick. <laughs> Yeah, it's got all the power of the helmet of fate without the whole possessing your body problem. <laughs> it seems, but there is also the line of Clarion saying something about there. The, you think the opposition's new arrangement is going to change anything, and you're like, "What? Who? Doing what now?" I have questions, Clarion. Uh, any theories? 
Yeah, I wasn't sure if that alluded to the fact that like Vandal is talking to Naboo. Because at the end of the day, technically, whatever element of Naboo is in there still in, like started as Vandal's son. Yeah. And so like I don't know if that connection is there, but at the same time, like Claren is still on the meeting the Zoom meeting for the light. So like And it's also like how would Clarion know if Dr. Fate and Vandal Savage are communicating? Because that seemed relatively secret. Yeah. Uh, and how is that a new development and all of those things? And it's also the question of like, do they mean, does he mean the, the Lord of the Lords of Orders new arrangement? Or does he mean like the Justice League? Or what is it like? What does he mean? Probably Lords of Chaos and Order because they are opposition to each other and really don't care about the affairs of men. But yeah. <laughs> we'll see. It's a whole thing. And. My last one here, my last theory for the future is that I kind of alluded to like, I have thoughts on this cat, but I feel like the implied solution as of now, I'm throwing this out in the way that sometimes I try to predict uh, how plot lines are going to resolve and we see if I'm wildly off the mark or not. Uh, I feel like the solution to defeating child is almost definitely going to be that they have to target the the flaw in flaws makeup uh, because they made a point of acknowledging that it's his literal name uh when clarion attacks him at one point in this episode and is like why didn't that destroy you like the part of him that's the the diamond the flaw in the diamond like glows a little bit like trying to remind you that this thing is here and nobody has directly targeted it i feel like that's going to be the weak point and that's how we're going to take this down because i think it's funny and interesting and telling about this character that she came to earth and made her anchor on this mortal plane a very powerful indestructible diamond thing because diamonds are hard to break in case anyone has not (laughs) remembered that recently uh instead of clarion whose anchor is just a cat with the you know the strength and durability of cat uh with optional saber tooth tiger version of cat yeah but is still a like normal susceptible cat in some ways like they show that at one point holid just takes out tickle by putting putting them to sleep uh just kind of just knocks them out for a bit um yeah that was an interesting because like it started like clarion started to fade and like i couldn't figure out like what what the spell really was doing but yeah i was like oh okay because yeah your options are cat or larger cat (laughs) not literally diamond but i also to me and i'm sure i'll go into this in like deep dive stuff at some point but i want to throw this out that this to me tells me so much about these character like sets clarion and child apart because if you just introduce two lords of chaos it would be very easy to make them very similar but i feel like these episodes are doing a lot of work to set them apart and show how they're different and some of that is showing that Child is more tactically minded than Car- mm. Clarion in a lot of ways. Of From the, I'll make my anchor on this plane hard to destroy. I will do things that are violent for reasons and do things that are seem over the top with a reason to them. Whereas Clarion repeatedly is like, I did this because I thought it was fun. I did this because I thought it would be interesting. And even the weird, like, sidetrack of that is, this is going to be the weirdest thing I say about Clarion ever, but uh, Clarion cares about his anchor. Clarion cares about Tickle in a way that Child doesn't seem to care about Flaw. Mm -hmm. And this, to me, is very telling about these characters. And we'll see how that plays out. I know we have been clearly setting up Clarion in this arc as, like, the devil you know versus the devil you don't, and how everybody's just used to clarion at this point we can deal with clarion he's a problem and he's a lot but he's our problem uh and child is this strange unknown but like the fact that the first thing we see of clarion in these episodes is him sitting on the the light zoom call just just petting tickle on his shoulder like clear and they're both like having a good time like you know you do in your office meeting with your cat kind of vibe uh just hanging you're out. the normal person who might have a cat that just jumps into your lap when you're trying to do your work versus child immediately 
murdering a man and picking a diamond as the thing that'll keep her alive. And yeah, I just have I just have some thoughts apparently about these Lords of Chaos, and I apologize yeah. for this weird off the rails uh, tangent for a bit. Do you have any more theories to get us back on track before we wrap up for the day? Sorry. Yes. So we'll look at both end credits because I feel like oftentimes the end credits allude to things that definitely get into tinfoil hats and, and theories and all of that. So yes. from episode nine, Chameleon Boy and Saturn Girl are literally just sitting on a park bench watching Star you know, uh, what space Trek 3016 while eating a bag of chicken whizzies. So where are you? When are you? And chicken whizzies. Those are my notes. Uh, the, where are you is actually, that's the same bench that Jefferson and Jace stop at in a previous episode in season three that I Uh think is in metropolis question mark i might be remembering the place wrong because i forgot to check this but i saw the comparative screenshots going around twitter this the last week or the week before so it's the exact same background so i think that's intentionally the same space but i can't remember if it's metropolis or new york that they're in uh in that episode i'm sure someone will correct us or you can find it if you google it but that answers the where the when is a much bigger question (laughs) Yeah, because I mean, the assumption is that those dates mean a lot, but we're also not given a date when we cut to the end credits. So, I don't know. We'll see. I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure that this, I'm sure it's great. Speaking of things that are definitely fine, I yeah. mean, you know, an immortal being who's super uncomfortable with things that are going on Earth to the point where he's literally trying to get people off onto the war world. And so, um, yeah, that seems bad. Yeah, that does seem bad. Very bad. When Vandal Savage, immortal being that he is, goes, I just got to get off this planet. You're like, oh, oh, that's not yeah. good. Yep, and we'll and see how that plays out. Yeah. Any theories? Which I, well, I assume it's the, I mean, the the prevailing theory that I've seen kick around is that it's the psychic backups of whoever they have. I was, re, I was going to say, like, because you think of the very first episodes, because they clearly had psychic backups and potentially, like, DNA backups of Aqualad, Robin, and Kid Flash. So... Oh, so that's my. I forget theory. that sometimes. I forget that that's how this whole show started. Yeah. So then, like, you just had them rolling. With, they rolled match out at the other at another point, and they like, yeah. So I mean, I'm sh- I'm sure it's fine. That's fine. And and that's how and that's how Wally comes back. Everyone, they're going to use the side <laughs> back, and they've been cloning him the entire time. For. For those of you listening at home who can't see Neil, Neil just uh, mimed putting on a tinfoil hat for that whole bit. Yeah. So Have fun. I feel like you it, need that context to fully it's possible. understand. Who knows? Everything who knows? Utter, we don't literal know. Literal chaos. Literal chaos. Yeah. This arc is just literal chaos. And with all that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and a rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a lot harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please be- consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. 
Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 